come to worship, I invite you to stand and join us as we sing Christ is Made the Sure. A reading from the book of Hosea. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take for yourself a wife of whoredom, and have children of whoredom, for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. 
So he went and took Gomer, daughter of Diblahim, and she conceived and bore him a son. And the Lord said to him, Name him Jezreel, for in a little while I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. On that day I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. She conceived again and born a daughter. Then the Lord said to him, Name her lo Ruhamin, for I will no longer have pity on the house of Israel or forgive them, but will have pity on the house of Judah, and I will save them by the Lord their God. I will not save them by, bow, by bow or by sword or by war or by horses or by horsemen. When she had weaned lo Ruhama, she conceived and bore a son. Then the Lord said, Name him lo Ami, for you are not my people and I am not your God. Yet the number of people of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which can neither measure nor number, and in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, it shall be said to them, Children of the living God. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks. And let us say Psalm 85 together responsively. You have been gracious to the, your land, O Lord, and have, you have restored the good fortune of Jacob. You have given me the dignity of the people and brought forth their services. You have withdrawn all your fury and turned yourself from your wrathful indignation. Restore us then, O God, our Savior. Let your hand depart from us. Will you be displeased with us forever? Will you prolong your anger from age to age? You will not give us life again, but your people may rejoice in you. Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will listen to what the Lord has to say, for he is in peace to his faithful people and to those who turn their hearts to him. Truly, his salvation is very near to those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have listened to them. Truth shall spring up from the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. The Lord will indeed grant prosperity, and our land will be Righteousness shall go before him, and peace shall be a pathway for his feet. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, as now, and ever shall be, or will ever be. Amen. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Colossians. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the universe, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have come to fullness in him, who is the head of every ruler and authority. In him also you are circumcised with a spiritual circumcision by putting off the body of the flesh in the circumcision of Christ. When you are buried with him in baptism, you are also raised with him through faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead to trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive together with him when he forgave us all our trespasses, erasing the record that stood against us with his legal demands. He set this aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and made a public example of them, triumphing over them in it. Therefore, do not let anyone condemn you in matters of food and drink or of observing festivals, new moons, or Sabbaths. These are only a shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Do not let anyone disqualify you, 
insisting on self-abasement and worship of angels dwelling on visions, puffed up without cause by a human way of thinking and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows with a growth that is from God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. to Luke. Jesus was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. Jesus said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. And Jesus said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, Do not bother me. The door has already been locked, and my children are in bed with me. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Search, and you will find. Knock and the door will be open for you. For everyone who asks, receives, and everyone who searches, finds, and for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, would give it a snake instead of a fish? Or if a child asks for an egg, will give it a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The Gospel of Christ. Generous and compassionate to all whom we meet, 
and keep our bodies healthy and strong so we may be active in living your will. Amen. Amen. It's always so nice or so enjoyable when we get to read scripture and right there are the words that we have from our Eucharist, from hymns. Right there are the words that our ancestors had taken the gospel and taken the, the New Testament and made it into part of our worship. And now we know where the Lord's Prayer came from. I wonder if at any point in your life you have ever wondered, I'm not sure I'm praying right. Right. The disciples at this time when we're in the book of Luke, the disciples have been with Jesus for a long time. A long time. Right? We're in chapter 11 now. He's sent them out into villages on their own. And they have been watching him repeatedly go out on his own and pray. I would imagine that, of course, they've prayed together, too. They've sat around. And one of the disciples has enough courage to put up his hands and say, can you teach us how to pray? And when he asks that question, what's the assumption? The assumption is that he doesn't know how to pray or that he's been doing it wrong. Well, I want to share with you a little bit about my experience of prayer from the time I was, I, I can remember. So let's say maybe my 8, 9, 10, 11 years old is what I can remember back. I, I will admit this, that the only time I prayed other than at church was if I needed God's help with something. It was all about, please God, can you do something for me? However, I would butter God up a little bit. So I would start my prayers like this. Oh, and by the way, I want to have context. So I grew up in the 70s. And some of you may remember a, a book by Judy Bloom called Dear God, It's Me, Margaret. This was quite a controversial book back then because it talked about menstruation. Right? So it was a very controversial book. So I would start my prayer to God at my ripe age of 9 or 10 and say, Dear God, it's me, Michelle Berry, 7th Horcliffe Drive, Belleville, Ontario. Like I would want to make sure that he knew exactly where I was and, and that I could get a direct line, you know, right, right to God. And then at the beginning of my prayer, and I was praying because I needed something. Like I didn't, I wasn't praying for a new bicycle or for candies or anything. There was something that I wanted in my life for me or myself, me or others. And I, but I would always begin by thanking God. You know, buttering him up, talking about all the good things he's done, and then I would come in for the ask. Then I went away to summer camp. I went away to Anglican summer camp for 10 years. I was a camper and then a counselor and then on waterfront. And we had, a, we had a chaplain that would talk to us about how singing, right, camp, you know, happy, clappy camp songs were a form of prayer. And he made the connection for us to the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms are all of songs, and you know many times we have experiences of singing with them, but they were a way of prayer that David did by singing. Well, still, we, we, are, we ask the question, and the disciple asks the question, how do I pray? So in some of my work as a spiritual director and a chaplain at hospitals, people will say to me, how do I pray? Well, our prayer, our, our prayer is this sacred conversation between us and God. So it doesn't matter what we say, it doesn't matter when we say it, it doesn't even matter how we say it, or if we say anything at all. So I want you to imagine when, when Jesus lays out for the disciples how to pray. Remember, they also have asked Jesus, Jesus, one of the disciples, which of these laws are the most important? Right? They're all trying to figure out this new world order whereby Jesus is present on earth to show us that we are forever reconciled and in right relationship with God. How do we pray? What words do we need to use? How do we acknowledge this amazing conversation between us and between God? The Lord's Prayer gives us, at the beginning of the Lord's Prayer, right, which in Luke here we just get four or five sentences. There is, in another one of the Gospels, there's the full Lord's Prayer that we are more familiar with, with all the rest of the sentences. And he's, 
he just says to us when we're praying, it's about talking to God and making, asking God to keep us in right relationship, right? Keep us in right relationship with you, God. Keep me humble and know that I am loved and help me make sure that I am just as kind and compassionate to other people as you are to me. So when we pray together as a community, we, ha we have different forms of prayer that we've gotten used to in an Anglican tradition or even an Anglo-Catholic tradition. Our prayers of the people are, what, are a form, if you will, of what we call intercessions or supplications. So that means we're praying to God and asking him to intercede for the good of others or for the good of ourselves. So we pray for the world, we pray for people, we pray for peace, we pray for people who are sick. We're asking God to manifest the Holy Spirit in these places in our lives and this world where we need God's help. We also, in a lot of our prayers, do what I did at the beginning of my prayer, which is prayers of thanksgiving and gratitude. That the whole concept of experiencing the joy and the love that God has to offer it starts with a foundation of gratitude and appreciation. Our ability to be in prayer, and this is, I often do this walking, right? A walking prayer where I just, whatever walk I'm on, instead of being distracted by my phone or by the dog, just what is it that I see in, in this universe that I'm grateful for, right? That my walk is a, a walk, a mindful walk of gratitude and appreciation for where God is. So we have intercessions, supplications, we have gratitude and thanksgiving. If you remember the Book of Common Prayer, so some of you who come, in, and we, we actually say that verse here too at the 10 o'clock, which, um, which is lovely, where we say when two or more are gathered. Well, when I was a teenager, when I was 15, 16, my parents got divorced. So we didn't go to church anymore, and we went every Sunday. So we moved to a different town, we moved to Pickering, and so I started to go to church by myself. But I felt, I didn't feel comfortable because I was alone by myself, I felt sorry for myself. People would always, you know, try to talk to you and I just wanted to go and worship. And I, I believed, falsely, that my prayers, like me praying alone, my intercessions and my prayers of thanksgiving, that it, it wasn't worthy because it was just little old me. Right? It was just me. So because I believe you had to have two or three people where two or more are gathered. So this is what I did. I was, a, I was a runner. I played soccer, so I did a lot of running. So on Saturday nights, before I went out or did whatever, I would go running with my prayers that I had written all out on my little you know, sheets of note paper. And I'd stick them in my running shorts, or my Walkman, my pouch actually, my Walkman pouch. And I would go running to the Anglican Church in Pickering, Ontario. And at the front of the church was a big door with big stone steps that we didn't use. We used the side door. And I would shove all my prayers underneath the stairs because then, tomorrow, two or three people would be gathered and my prayers would count for something. 25 years later, my husband and I went back to that church one day, great day in Pickering, drove up, dug all out, and there were all my papers. All my papers. A year and a half were the prayers I would shove it under the stairs. So here's the thing about our conversations with God. Our desire to be in relationship with God and to open our hearts and our souls to where it is and how it is that God's love is in our life, that's prayer. That's prayer. So there is no right way to pray. There is no wrong way to pray. There's a way that says, I want to open up a dialogue. And sometimes you feel like giving thanks. Sometimes you need to ask and you need, to, you need to ask specifically for what we want. There are other times, though, where the, the, the manifesting of God in conversation with us will come to us when we are completely quiet. There is an ancient form of prayer that the monastic traditions of the Christian church, many, many of them follow, called contemplative prayer. Have anyone heard of contemplative prayer? So I learned contemplative prayer at a monastery in Cambridge, Massachusetts with Anglican monks in 2007. I was at this uh, farm-like retreat center for seven days, silent, and we had five services a day. And at the seven o'clock evening service, which was the second last one, they would do contemplative prayer. 
So the very first time I showed up, all the pew, like all the pews are taken away. There's some cushions, there's some prayer benches, there's some little stools. And at the front, on a stand, there's an icon, right, of a nice religious icon picture. And in this case, it was, um, it was, it was the Virgin Mary with baby Jesus in her arms, but also Jesus adult behind her, right? So kind of you could fix on it. No instructions, no bulletin, no leader. So what's happening here? Like, when does this get started? Like, what's happening? So then one of the monks obviously saw that I didn't know what I was doing, taps me on the shoulder, he takes me outside the, the worship area, and he says, have you ever done that type of prayer? I said, no. So he said, just be still and know that I am God. Psalm 4610, just be still. Focus on the icon, just as a way to focus your thoughts so that if you get distracted and any other thoughts come into your mind, just bring it back to the picture. No judgment. And just, if you, if you feel that you need to invite yourself into this prayer, contemplative prayer, simply ask, God, where are you calling me? So contemplative prayer is about, you know, how you, you see the busyness of the butterflies, right, or the moths, and how they, when they finally sit down and they're just quiet and still. Our ability to be quiet and to be still is to allow God's messages to get through. I say it's kind of like we're, we, you know, in our lives we get too many text messages and too many phone calls and too many voicemails. Well, God's presence in our life is like that. And often because we learn to pray by, by being active. Remember like Martha last, last week? Martha was busy doing, 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 doing. Whereas Mary sat at Jesus' feet and just listened. She listened for what was it that God was calling her forward in her life. I am fascinated to learn that through MRI studies now, the monastic traditions, many of the monastic traditions have allowed themselves uh, to be studied, if you will, by uh, medical institutions where they use MRIs to show the magnitude of transformation that happens in your brain, where the areas of empathy and compassion and altruism are much deeper and richer and stronger the more contemplative prayer a monk would be doing. So as we think about our busyness and our, our, our belief that there's a right way to pray, we have lots of tools at our disposal. We have the Lord's Prayer, right? I always say to people, if you need to keep it, if you, want to, if you, if you feel overwhelmed, start with the Lord's Prayer. If you want to go step number two, start with gratitude. Start with the way that I did when I was eight or nine years old, just listing and naming and, and showing God that you see the goodness of his love in your life, in this world. And you don't need two or three people when we need to put our petitions to God. And then if there are times in your life that you want to live more from your spiritual self and you're not quite sure how to do that or where to do that, that's where contemplative prayer gives us this opportunity just to be still and say, okay, show me the way. Let me be still and aware enough to hear through all the other messages the world is sending me, what are you saying to me? I often get asked, often, often, about prayer. And I learned this five-finger prayer probably 10 years ago. I went back to the summer camp that I grew up at as the chaplain, which is cool because my kids came too. And at this summer camp, so there's swimming and archery and crafts and all kinds of other stuff, and the kids all come to the chaplain for an hour and a half every day, which is amazing when you think about it, right? So. What child has ever experienced an hour and a half of, like, chaplain God? There's only so many coloring sheets you can do, like Sunday school. So I had this kind of approach as if, as if we were all learning disciples, like, from the very beginning. And one of the topics that we talked about over two days was how to pray. And so I just want to share with you this little prayer. Because if you ever have people in your life who are, you know, wanting to pray, or you yourself want something more than the Lord's Prayer, called the five finger prayer. Everyone get your hand out because I want you to remember this. So first, the thumb. The first thing we pray for is people close to us. People close to me. 
right? People that we love, that we care about, even people that we don't necessarily find it easy to love and care about, people that are close to us in our world that we know. Pointer finger. People that point us in the right direction. So educators and uh, teachers, people that show us the way, that help us, doctors, you know, with knowledge and insight. I never, you know the finger I'm holding up now, this one, I'm not gonna do that. This finger, if you look at your hand, this finger is the tallest finger of all your fingers, it's the tallest. So when we get to this finger, we pray for those in positions of power and authority and influence, right? And, and you see it often that in our prayers of the people, we pray for their judgment and their discernment and their compassion. <coughs> the ring finger, try to move your ring finger alone without another finger. You can't do it, it's weak. It's the weakest finger you have, your ring finger. And the ring finger then reminds us to pray for those who are weak, right? Who are suffering, who are marginalized, who are sick, right? Who are in need of the knowledge and sense that God is present in their lives. And then the little ring finger, little old me, pray for yourself. Pray for what we need. So that's a five finger prayer. People close to us, people that guide, lead, direct, teach, people in positions of power, authority, influence in the world, those that are weak, hurting, not strong, and little old me. So I wish you a rich and robust prayer life where you know that God is always listening. You don't need to tell him your last name or where you live. You don't even need to butter him up with words of thanks. It is a conversation, it is a platform by which God is always waiting always sitting pensively, waiting for us to open up our hearts and our minds and our souls to be in relationship with him. Amen. I invite you to stand as we profess our faith together. Let us confess our faith as we say we believe in one God, Father the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made. confidence to the Lord singing O Lord guard and direct your church in the way of unity service and praise this week we pray for Victoria and Halliburton Deanery let us pray an awareness of the unity of the Holy Family. Let us pray. <laughs> Cleanse our hearts of prejudice and selfishness and inspire us to hunger and thirst for what is right. Let us pray. for your greater
your praise, that all may share the good things you provide. Let us pray. Strengthen all who give their energy or skill for the healing of those who are sick in body or mind. We pray for Joe Catafano, Sierra Catafano, Gordon Yadu, Craig Krishnan, Maureen Cornio, Selfin Moore, James Schiltz and his family, Muhib Latif, Roxanne Latouche, Ron Alvarez, Lorraine P Piotrowski, and Marcia McCann. Let us pray. Set free all who are bound by fear and despair. Let us pray. rest to all who have died. Diane Clark and Isabel Morrison, for whom our memorial flowers are offered today, and your comfort to those who mourn. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. He welcomes sinners and invites them to his table. Let us confess our sins confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon us. Harden and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and keep us in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you.
Christ, our Savior and Redeemer. He is your living Word, through whom you have created all things. By the power of the Holy Spirit, He took the flesh of the Virgin Mary and shared our human nature. He lived and died as one of us to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. In fulfillment of your will, he stretched out his hands in suffering to bring release to those who place their hope in you. And so he won for you a holy people. He chose to bear our griefs and sorrows and to give up his life on the cross that he might shatter the chains of evil and death and banish the darkness of sin and despair. By his resurrection, he brings us into the light of your presence. Now with all creation, we raise our voices to proclaim the glory of your name.
together. God of grace, we have received the memorial of the death and resurrection of your Son. May your love, according to us, bring us to your promises. We ask this in the name of our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Amen. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God, our generation in the church and in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds and our bodies in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. The blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be amongst us and remain with us always. Amen. Amen. Uh, please be seated for uh, a few announcements. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Well, it is very good to see that we all could be here this morning, even though the weather doesn't look so bright. Anyway, today I have a number of uh, announcements to make, and I'm going to ask you to remain with us for a few minutes at the end of the service so that we can present you with where we're at 
at this uh, present time. Now, first of all, I would like to say that this past week, we uh, realized that Reverend Sanford will end our ministry with us uh, today. And of course, it was uh, a little bit surprising and of course, uh, disappointing. But we must accept this as God's will and commandment. And I think today the presentation of the gospel, just uh, as I was sitting there, that revealed that to me, that what we need to do is to keep on praying. And it's all indicated in this, uh, in this gospel. I wasn't thinking about it before, but it seems so appropriate what was uh, presented today. So, on behalf of this congregation, I would like to thank Reverend Sanford for our presence with us for this period of time. And I believe that we are fortunate to have had you for the past several weeks. And uh, when I listen to your presentation today, really, I just feel uh, gratitude because it tells us, you know, the power of prayer. And I think that should be our focus, not just for yesterday, but today and moving forward. We need that so much. Now, on behalf of us here at St. John, and for those who are not even present today, I'd like to say that we really appreciate your presentations and your unique interpretation of the word. That's very important. A different style in delivery. And for all the moments you share with us during our coffee hour. And I believe that you will be in our thoughts for several weeks to come, if not months. So on behalf of the Church of St. John the Baptist, we wish you good health. Could you rise, please? Yes, ma'am. Oh, wow. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> we wish you good health, prosperity, a fruitful future. And we'd like you to accept this bouquet of flowers as a symbol of our appreciation and best wishes for your continued journey on the spiritual path. Thank you so Thank much. You much. Thank you very much. My pleasure. My honor. Thank you very much. We will continue yes. after Thank you. service. So please stand as we sing together our recessional hymn, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus.
Hallelujah. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.